freedom oh freedom over me and before i be a slave oh freedom in my grave oh, and go home to my lord oh oh freedom Oh. 
Official Emancipation Day, everyone. My name is Vereen Shepherd, and I'll be taking you through this e conversation today. Welcome to this e conversation themed Emancipation Day Matters, Materiality, and Cultural Contestation in Jamaica, a collaborative event between the University of the West Indies Museum and the Center for Reparation Research, both of course at the University of the West Indies, located in the regional headquarters. Speaking of the museum, join me in congratulating the museum's curator, Dr. Shani Ropa Edwards and her husband, Latin Edwards, on the recent birth of Salim. Congratulations. This event, of course, was the brainchild of Dr. Shani Roper Edwards, and the center is very pleased to have been asked to partner with the center. Those of us who believe in marking historical anniversaries on the day that they occur, whether Sunday or Saturday, celebrated yesterday. But of course, August 2 would also have been a day of rejoicing by our ancestors. So it is all good. It was 183 years ago that the scam called the apprenticeship system which delayed the implementation of the Emancipation Act that ought to have come into force on 1st August, 1834, came to an end. And it was a very welcome end in the British colonized Caribbean. Of course, Antigua and Bermuda bypassed the apprenticeship system as planters there had no intention of supporting the laborers anymore in food, clothing, and healthcare. As we celebrate in our different ways, however, let us recall the heroes and heroines there and the revolutionary actions of these heroes and heroines that hastened the ending of the system of chattel enslavement, including King Court or Tachi or Prince Klaus, Filda and Queen of Antigua, Barbuda, Nani Grig and Busa of Barbados, Adelaide Disson of Trinidad and Tobago, Jack Gladson of Guyana, Pompey of the Bahamas, Nan of the Maroons, Chief Techie, Chief Jamaica, Kitty Scarlett, and Samuel Sharp of Jamaica. It is for them that many of us press for repatriate justice. You can do them no greater honor than to also join the reparation movement as a signal that their sacrifice was not in vain. This afternoon then, our panelists, Mr. Bernard Janke, Dr. Lisa Tomlinson, Dr. Louis Moyston, and Nana Erna Broadbuck, Dr. Erna Broadbuck, will explore the contested history of Emancipation Day in Jamaican history. Emancipation Day matters is conceptualized as three separate panels that will engage the Jamaican and regional audience on emancipation as a transitional period with significant cultural, social, economic, and political implications instead of a specific moment lasting a day in history. The second goal is to show that Emancipation Day matters throughout the region, thus locating Jamaica's Emancipation Day within a regional context of diverse approaches to Emancipation Day celebrations. The third goal is to draw connections between reparation and emancipation. So the panels are conceptualized as three. Pan program one, Emanci Emancipation Day matters, which we're doing today materiality and cultural contestation in Jamaica. Program two, Emancipation Day Matters, 
materiality and cultural contestation of the English speaking Caribbean will come up on October, in October 2021, the specific day you will hear about later on. And program three, Emancipation Day Matters, Emancipation Day celebrations in the French, Spanish, and Dutch Caribbean that we will be in Black History Month in February 2022 as we try to connect, of course, our region as one. And so we're going to start off this afternoon with the presentation by Mr. Bernard Janke. Let me introduce him to you. It is my absolute pleasure actually to do so. Mr. Janke holds a BA in mass communication and an MPhil in government from the University of the West Indies. His MPhil thesis was entitled Politics, Ideology and the Media in Jamaica, an analysis of the development of the electronic media 1972 to 1992. He also holds an MA in Anthropology of Media from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. His background is in media studies and cultural heritage research and administration, which began in the early 1980s with the Jamaica Memory Bank, which was a product or a project of the then Division of Culture in the office of the Prime Minister. This was followed by a stint at the Creative Production and training center where he rose to the position of senior video producer, supervising the work of the television production department and conducting training for the production crew in addition to producing programs for the institution. Mr. Janke has also been involved at the policy level in the areas of cultural heritage and intellectual property. He was a facilitator in the public consultations on the formulation of Jamaica's 2003 national cultural policy and has also participated in the current review of that policy to bring, to bring it in line with current imperatives. He, has also, um, he was also part of the team responsible for the formulation of Vision 2030, Jamaica National Development Plan with particular reference to the cultural sector. So he will speak to us for 10 to 15 minutes on the topic, 19th century cultural retentions and emancipation day. So, Mr. Janke, you have the floor. Thanks, Professor Shepard. Very input and for those very kind words. Um, I want to start by going, having a, a sample for mo moment, looking backwards to look forward, and put this presentation, brief presentation into context in, in terms of resilience, the resilience of those who were transported forcibly across the Atlantic into the Western Hemisphere, Jamaica in particular would be my focus. And the ability to retain, despite efforts to totally dehumanize and de-Africanize the enslaved peoples on plantations across Jamaica, who somehow continued to maintain their cultural traditions. Um, one example of this um, is the, is the um, Maroon heritage, which spans some 300 plus years. And although they were liberated before, the rest of the African and African descended population. They continue to maintain, and particularly in terms of their language with kind of resilience. Um, foodways, for example, are also an example of, of cultural retention that preceded 19th century, but continues to this day. Now, looking at the coming of, of emancipation, This heralded in new cultural practices, one of which was directly related to emancipation and celebratory of emancipation. And I speak of Brookings or Brookings Party, which although um, full emancipation was granted in 1838, the practice really did not surface until a year later in 1839. And this arose largely and coming from testimony of, of elders who were interviewed 
in the 60s and 70s that there was um, a reluctance to believe that the enslaved people had been actually emancipated because there had already been rumors before that the enslaved had been freed and the, the, the Sam Sharp war was a consequence of, of that, um, but one of the consequences. And so they waited for an entire year before developing the celebration, which was really built on earlier um, practices, the, the set dances of the enslaved women in particular, um, going back centuries before. And this new emanation also involved males. And it, it was a, a combination, and to, to paraphrase the late Professor Nettleford, it was the rhythm of Europe to the melodies of Africa. The, rather, the melodies of Europe to the rhythm of Africa. And it, it was really a combination of very stylized set dance involving two groups, a red group and a blue group, who performed um, mock dances, mock competitions, beginning on the evening of July 31st and continuing into Emancipation Day on August 1st. And this, this practice occurred in different parts of the island, but are, are best known for its retention and continuation in the Eastern Parish of Portland, in specifically in um, Manchineal and Belfield. And, and that practice continues to this day. It is, it is a, a, a celebration of freedom and was specifically, specifically um, engaged to celebrate that freedom. The, 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 the celebration um, is also related to um, a tea, tea meeting, which preceded emancipation, but really gained strength in the post-emancipation period. So it was a combination of various cultural forms which provided um, entertainment and also provided um, an element, a very strong element of, of uh, celebration of this new freedom from the shackles of enslavement. Lesser known, but also related to emancipation um, were cultural forms that came in through Africans who landed in Jamaica, ostensibly liberated from slavers from other European powers in the Caribbean and um, taken off these slavers by the British Navy, initially transported to St. Helen and to Sierra Leone, but planters in the, in the Anglophone Caribbean also wanted to have the opportunity to, to, to continue with, with African workers. So, euphemistically, they were persuaded to sign up indentures. And so, according to Monica Schuler's dissertation on this, approximately 8,000 quote unquote liberated Africans from Central and West Africa found their way to Jamaica and settled in various parts of the island. Now, out of this, a number of cultural practices um, were introduced into the, into the country. The, um, Kumina to the east in St. Thomas, where a relatively large African indentured population, mainly from the Congo region, were um, indentured on plantations, and they brought with them their religious practice, um, Kumina, which 
spread to different parts of the island, mainly St. Catherine um, and some parts of Portland. Some people ascribe a presence also in parts of Trelawney. But Comuna is best known and, and strongest in um, St. Thomas in, in this present day. Also, to the west of the island, in the parishes of Hanover and Westmoreland, two practices um, emerge, the Etu and Nago, similar cultural practices, which pay tribute to ancestors and were retained and are still practiced. In fact, in, in Westmoreland, the Nago people established themselves in an area that they call a Beokuta, which um, signals their ancestral homeland. And interestingly enough, in the mid 1980s, when Professor Wallace Schoenker visited Jamaica on a research mission, he was taken to a Beokuta and um, was, I mean, almost brought to tears by the fact that he met people who he said looked like his grandmother, his, his grandparents, his ancestors, and they, they actually maintained the pronunciation of that village because they came originally from a Bekuta, or Bekuta for short, in, in, in um, Nigeria. So there, there has been this influx as well as retention in the post-emancipation period. As I say, some celebratory directly of emancipation and some as a consequence of emancipation. I must also refer very briefly to, to another cultural form, um, revival, which um, came out of the Great Revival um, and formed a religious movement in Jamaica. Um, the, Called Revival, which uh, has a spiritual home in what town? In the center of, of the island, almost in, in, in the parish of Sedan. And that practice has spread not only from what town, but across the island and also has an international face. The revival groups that were established in other countries, but revival from Jamaica has also spread its wings. And you can find revival groups and churches in different parts of the world. Um, as, as far away as, as um, Germany in Europe, as um, some of the research that we have done indicates. So there is, in a way, a very strong post-emancipation cultural retention that still exists today. So, you know, I will, I will leave it there if, if there are any questions following the discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Janke. And now we'll hear from Dr. Lisa Tomlinson. She's our next speaker. Let me introduce her to you. She's a lecturer at the University of the West Indies at the Mona campus in the Institute of Caribbean Studies. She teaches courses on the Caribbean and the African diaspora. Um, her specialty is in film, and she also teaches Caribbean cultural studies. She's the author of the books entitled The African Jamaican Aesthetic, Cultural Retention and Transformation Across Borders. And of course, I think we all enjoy the launch of this other book, Una Marson in the Caribbean Biography Series. Some of her other publications include book chapters in, Jamaica, uh, um, in Jamaicans in the Canadian Experience, A Multiculturalizing Presence, Archipelagos of Sound, Transnational Caribbeanities, Women and Music, and Critical Insights, The Harlem Renaissance, and The Routledge Handbook, Routledge Handbook to the Culture and Media of the Americas. She's currently the Deputy Festival Director for the GATFest Film Festival and Co-Chair for the Film and Visual Arts Committee at the Caribbean Studies Association. And her presentation is on representations of emancipation in literature. Dr. Tomlinson, happy to turn this over to you now. Good 
Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy Emancipation Day. Is everyone hearing me? I hope. <laughs> okay, just unmute myself. We're, we're hearing you now. Okay, great. All righty. So um, as um, Professor um, Shepard said, I'm going to be looking at um, literature and it's, you know, the way emancipation is represented in such. Um, what I want to do is just very quickly read a short uh, quotation by Jamaica Kincaid from A Small Place. And I just want you to reflect on this this quote as I proceed through the paper. Uh, the quote reads, and I quote, I met the world through England, and if the world wanted to beat me, it would have to do so through England, end of quote. So please so use that as a reflection as we go through the paper. So in the construction of Caribbean national identity, it has not always been the goal of the political players to favor the desired images or aspirations of the African Caribbean people. Our national identity has been represented within the confines of respectability politics that maintains a Britishness that does not speak to the complete cultural identity of African people. For instance, from the 19th century onward, British literature, histories, travel narratives, and other writings depicted Caribbean people as a shadow of England. All of these texts neglected African Caribbean indigenous cultures and belief systems. Hence, Caribbean writers have had to establish their difference from this tradition to reclaim a legitimate literary voice and to articulate Caribbean lived realities. Significantly, Caribbean writers have established a relationship between the novel and history by weaving together the past into the present. As such, many Caribbean writers foreground the memory of colonialism and emancipation within their characters' constant struggle between the coexistence of the imperial and native culture. Moreover, the writers are tasked to negotiate their characters' challenge in finding their own cultural identity. In this fashion, Caribbean writers use their historical narratives as an ideal tool for imaginative re-envisioning of self and nation. While there are many works of fiction that engaged the novel and history through memory of colonialism and emancipation, my focus will be on Jamaica Kincaid's novel, Annie John, and Jean Reed's Why It's a Gossip Sea. I will analyze these two works of fiction to highlight how the writers redefine and re-represent African Caribbean emancipation through revisioning the history and reclaiming of the voice. In her novel, Annie John, Jamaica Kincaid centralizes Antigua's history within a colonial context. Even though the African Antiguans were liberated from chattel slavery, memories of colonial culture premiered the education system in the 20th century. For instance, the girls wore school uniforms and Annie John's European education was informed by literary texts from the empire that helped to shape and trace her period of brainwashing. Among them, literary um, books included Shakespeare, The Tempest, um, Milton's Paradise Lost, in addition to two history books, Roman Britain and the uh, History of the West Indies, which many of us are familiar with and came to England in that way. However, Annie John, the protagonist, embodies a resistance of Antigua's unstable sense of emancipation. I use the term unstable sense of emancipation to signal the double or competing identities in the novel that we see today in the Caribbean. That idea of two cultures competing with each other. In this way, Annie asserts her agency by rebelling against the European inscribed femininity and her colonial education. During recess, Annie acts as a ringleader and leads a group of girls in forbidden behavior amongst the old tombstones of white Europeans buried before slavery had been abolished in 1838. In behaving in this manner, she departs from her mother's identity, especially in attempting to defy her mother's order to behave like a lady. Annie leads the girl in dancing, singing the local calypso songs, which would be considered lewd and inappropriate, getting their clothes sweaty and using obscenities among the headstones. Annie's actions um, indicate her defiance against a colonial past, a complete rejection of the old ways and arch archaic legacies of colonialism. 
as she and the school girls, girls sit on the student tombstone thinking of ways to let their breasts grow, Annie laments, and I quote, what perfection we have found in each other, sitting on these tombstones as long dead people who had been the masters of our ancestors, end of quote. Pointedly, Elizabeth Brown Guillory highlights that the girl's subversive acts in the novel correlate with an uprising by slave women in the early 1800s. She states, and I quote, for in about 1831, slave women rose up to protest the abolishment of Sunday markets in St. John Antigua, a prelude to the general emancipation in 1934, or excuse me, 1834, end of quote. Thus, Guillory's analyst presents a revised history that inserts the presence of women in the attainment of African people's emancipation in the Caribbean. Likewise, the position that Annie, John, and the girls assume construct their own emancipation from colonialization within a more contemporary context. So we see how history and the past and the presence are joining together. Another direct pr protest against colonialism is Annie John's memory of Christopher Columbus. Annie John disrupts colonial Caribbean history by defacing the picture of Columbus in her textbook, A History of the West Indies. And she does this with her mother's phrase, and I quote, the great man can no longer just get up and go, end of quote. Through this conflicting theme of emancipation of African Caribbean people, King Kedla allows her protagonist to become the subject of her own narrative and experiences. Hence, Annie John talks back, or, or, or as our Rasta brethren would say, or brethren would say, she firebonds colonial history, authors her own text, and inserts a female self within the Caribbean nation. Finally, the novel The Whites or Garcia Sea is set in a time much closer to emancipation. The novel takes place right after the Emancipation Act of 1833 was initiated. This novel signifies the tension enslaved Africans or amongst the enslaved Africans, the Creole inhabitants and the minority whites. During the turmoil of emancipation, Annette, um, one of the characters, is forced to navigate her shifting identities between the local black population of the island and the white British. Her fractured identity and the loss of social positioning in the economic crisis after emancipation is distinctly defined. If I could quickly just read the quote, um, Antoinette, no, she's speaking to Christophine, and I quote, a white cockroach, that's me. That is what they call all of us who were here before their own people in Africa and then sold to the slave traders. And I've heard women call us white niggers. So between you, I often wonder who am I and where is my country and where do I belong? And why was I ever born at all, end of quote. In a nutshell, Antoinette and her daughter Antoinette are never given the opportunity to create a sense of self without conflict. Both characters suffer from mental breakdowns because of the persistent racial tension and isolation, which follows them even into marriage. Their inability to construct identity is a stark contrast to Annie John, who emerges from the struggles to affirm her own identity. Reyes, however, manages to retell Caribbean history from multiple perspectives, so from the Black population, the Creole, and the British. As such, she emphasizes the dreadful treatment of enslaved Africans and the fact that the lives of enslaved Blacks did not improve after 1833. She informs us of this through the Black character, Ruth um, Christophine, who is the nanny or helper. Christophine points to Antoinette that there are new ways of exploiting workers, even without the structures of slavery or the formal structures of slavery. She maintains, and I quote, the new ones have letter of the law, same thing, new ones worse than old ones, more cunning, that's all, end of quote. So for Jean Rees, the Emancipation Act does not only impact the lives of, right, the lives and the identities of the, of the Caribbean people, but it also takes on new forms of exploitation. In this case, modern day slavery in the form of slave wages. Black people are therefore not compensated fairly for their labor under the new regime of emancipation. The apprenticeship system became the last four years of slavery instead of four years of freedom. Although tragic, Jean Rees has truly recovered the Creole woman story from Charlotte Bronte's British representation while interrogating the British colonial ideas 
and the impact of emancipation. Pearl, or excuse me, April Pelt notes that, and I quote, Reese has reversed the gaze and placed her characters in opposite roles from what British literary canon has traditionally allowed them. End of quote. To conclude, a many Caribbean literary texts have in many ways acted as a window to the ongoing process of emancipation in, Carib in the Caribbean. Caribbean writers attempt to merge their own thoughts about the colonial relationship and emancipation with this concrete so social conditions and lived experiences of Caribbean people as we saw throughout the two books that I, I analyzed. Um, for example, providing critical observation of how the educational system have symbolized a counterproductive source to true emancipation and the struggle to negotiate identity. Their treatment of the theme emancipation, therefore, and I quote, and I, and I also end, ensures that readers must consider the allegorical impact of the authority figures and of the powerless characters who fight to see that their identities are not merely created through colonialist other, end of quote. So in other words, literary or literature, Caribbean literature in many ways has acted as a catalyst and that the ways in which to pull in, um, not just to readers, but to inform and to educate through their own personal experience of colonialism and issues of identities caused by emancipation, they've used their work as a historical narrative. And that is one of the reasons why I was really, I found it really fascinating that I was able to uh, speak to the novel and Caribbean literature as a form of, 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 of history and narratives around emancipation and colonialism. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was um, fascinating. And I go now to Dr. Moyston. I introduce him to you. He's a researcher, show political consultant, and radio talk show presenter on Best FM. He aims to redefine the role of contemporary radio as a platform for political education in Jamaica outside of the sphere of the two major political parties. His PhD thesis was on Leonard, Leonard P. Howell and the emergence of early Rastafari during the anti-colonial struggles, 1933 to 1938. Between the 1990s and now, he has written extensively in newspapers such as Caribbean Life out of New York, the Jamaica Gleaner and the Jamaica Observer on a wide range of issues in the historical, global, political, and cultural spheres. He has also produced a few chapters for two books, See Forth in the Eye of the Storm in Caribbean Political Activism, published in 2012, and Howell in the Studies of Rastafari, and Leonard P. Howell, a portrait in Leonard P. Howell and the Genesis of Rastafari, published in 2015. His major writing project, Rastafari Uprising, Leonard P. Howell and the Rise of Early Rasta, is in its final stage of editing. There are two other major writing projects, Rastafari Exodus, The Destruction of Pinnacle, the, Rastaf the Rastafari Industrial Mission, and the Ganja Chronicles, The Laws Versus the People. And these are completed, just awaiting refinement, he says. He has, of course, teaching experience in New York at Hunter College, and he continued this in Jamaica, teacher training and tertiary institutions. And I have to say he has been my guest on my radio show Talking History and will be again pretty soon. So Louis, it's over to you. Yes, um, give thanks Sister Vereen. And um, I want to really say um, it's really a pleasure to be on this program at this time celebrating emancipation. And I want to say to many people that I migrated to the United States during the 1980s, 81. And it was during my sojourn in terms of education and research, I really came across myself as a black person in Jamaica and began to deal with matters concerning Jamaica's history. I would like to say to you that, um, you know, when we look at 
for you and me and for other people? Can we use our creative imagination to really think about what took place between July 31st, 1838, and on that morning, August 1st? Just think about it. Just use our, this imagination. And even with all of that, 183 years after we are still singing a song, I wish I knew how it feels to be free. Nina Simone, in a very serious way. So what is the problem with emancipation in terms of those who would like to um, redefine, those who would like to kind of lock it down? And I will take it to this. There is still fear surrounding the idea of real black majority in Jamaican politics. It was this fear that inspired the abandonment of August 1st holiday in 1962. Emancipation Day is a sacred day. We all celebrate sacred days. Whether it's Easter, whether it is Christmas, whether it's birthday marriage. But the fact is, the only indigenous holiday or the first indigenous holiday is Emancipation Day. No, because it concerns black people. It is not anything that is supposed to be historical because this is how the perception was. But, so I am saying that in July, late July, 1838, the newspaper of the day editorial asked the colonial government not to celebrate emancipation. And why this was so? That it is going to steer up past it. But, and I'm saying that this is part of a historical white fear that existed in Jamaica that began in 1760 with Taki and Obi and Drummond and all of this kind of thing. It came forward right as we saw it in 1913 with the ganja law itself. Another time, white fear and black people smoking ganja and black people going to kill them. Huh? And in 1962, no. But what we said in 1962, let us look at the issue of race and the constitution. But, all right, now we're saying this, that August 1st was the first holiday for the slaves in Jamaica. In fact, it was the first established holiday in, um, that stemmed from the Jamaican rather than British heritage. But the rejection was grounded in the hubristic qualities of the white elites in Jamaica. The slaves began their celebration from midnight, July 31st. Then the next day, you know what they had was drumming, killing of animals, various forms of civic activities. In other words, emancipation was a point of activation for um, during that period before independence. But how was it? As a boy, I learned that emancipation day is that day when the duckies them come out to enjoy them freedom. And we were established not to go to river, not to go to bush, not to shoot bird that day. I do not know what a generation of the 1970s and the 1980s to 90s learn about emancipation. But probably in the 1980s, they were reconnected with that truncated past. One of the first black traditions to fall victim of the 1962 constitution is the, uh, uh, and the independence project was a discontinuation of the recognition and the celebration of emancipation. But now what is the relationship between the perception of race and the constitution? And we have to deal with this kind of thing because what we're saying right now is that the emancipation itself is that it is a point in which a point of activation for the reassessment of our politics in terms of race, that neglected force to become a part of the central feature in a form of political transformation in this country. Now, we are saying here now that when we look at, and, 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 and I'm dealing with race and the constitution, the seminal words in the Jamaican constitution of 1962, if those words are about order and council, the British Queen, a monarch, and Buckingham Palace. Palace, rather. How can there be democracy when a majority in the country is discriminated against? What? 
I'm saying that the Constitution is a conservative and it is a racist document. And what is the evidence? For example, let us look at all the colonial laws that were developed from 1760 to 1962. They became a part of that new independent movement, for example. Good? And they carried forward into independence, including the criminal sentence of lashing. Now, the discontinuation of the celebration of emancipation in 1962 was a great error committed by the, 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 the two political parties in 1962. But ne deeper neglect and denial of race and color issue became visible in the development of the national symbols, especially the crystallization of the national motto out of many one people. There's a view that it, the, the, the adoption of this motto is an indication of the intent to reject race, color, and class problem in Jamaica. Another view states that at the time of independence, the bipartisan support for a national motto reflects a deliberate and distinctive search for racial, racial, racially neutral formula or unifying sig signal that would not unduly excite racial conflict. One leading political scholar, and that was Carl, Carl Stone argues that the ideology of multiracialism should therefore be seen as an attempt to neutralize the hostility of the black masses towards a situation in which whites and other racial minorities um, dominate the economy. And there's also the reflection of this in the flag. Well, the black appears in the flag not as a representation of the ideal of black masses, right? But it is something symbolic of the hardship that we must face. Good, other national symbols, and whether it's a national prayer, national um, anthem is really Christian prayer. And that is also a problem because we need, while the Baptist church plays a significant role in emancipation, we need to look at the overall role of the Christian church through the lenses of Dr. T.E.S. Schultz in terms of our conquest. I am saying that today we need history more than ever to lead the way. As a people, we can express the wish that successive Jamaican government had made better use of history in the Jamaican decision-making. Let us make a small step. Let us continue to give recognition to an occasion that will be a point of activation and a force to galvanize the collective energies of our people towards a more meaningful future. August 1, make it my day. Thank you. Powerful words there, Louis. I can't argue with you about anything you have just said. You have really cemented some of the ideas I've been trying to bring across. And I think we need more people saying what you just said so that we don't have a situation that made Shani conceptualize this first panel um, we'll talk more about why she, she, she did this uh, in a while. But Nana Erna Broadbaugh is, um, can't be here with us face-to-face, -face, or when I say face-to-face, -face, she's not on the virtual either. But I want to introduce her to you because we have a recorded presentation. And so while that is being lined up, let me just tell you, I mean, if there's anybody in Jamaica who doesn't know Nana, um, somebody from abroad might be, well, not even that. <laughs> Everybody should know. She's a global icon, global figure. But anyway, I'll introduce her still. Protocol requires that I do so. So here is, uh, you know, something about our own Nana er Erna Broadbow of St. Mary's Black Space fame. And because the St. Mary may come from, you know, that she's an icon, right? I'm a sister. Born in 19, farmer and an elementary school teacher in Deep <laughs> Nana Erna Broadba attended secondary and tertiary institutions in the city of Kingston. She graduated from UCWI London, because remember at that time we were, UWI was a college uh, of the University of London, and proper, proper UWI with BA honors in history, and an MSc in sociology and a PhD in history. She enjoyed postgraduate fellowships at the University of Sussex in, in the UK in the anthropology department and in the department of psychiatry at the University of Washington in the USA. 
Nana Barbara was a senior lecturer at UWI and held visiting professorships in several US universities and in Germany. She settled in her native village in 1985 with her adopted son, where she's very involved with community development in her beloved and now famous creation, Black Space. She's the author of some 14 monographs, eight nonfiction, five novels, and one collection of short stories. She has been honored by the government of the Netherlands, the Institute of Jamaica, and received a Wyndham Campbell Award from Yale University. She's currently working on a book in search of great grandmother intended to give a closer look at the black Jamaican woman. A study of fiction and sociology called Man and Woman Story is ready for publication. And I hope this is not a dated um, bio. I, I would pay to know that these books have been published and I'm saying that they are forthcoming. So somebody can correct me in the chat. Anyway, let's hear now um, the recording from our own Erna Bondo. We can be freedom now. We can be freedom now. We can find a better way to go. We can be freedom now. We can be freedom now. We can find a better way to go. I was doing a piece of work. I was interviewing people over the age of seventy. Uh, born round about um, between the late 19th century and the first decades of the 20th century. I was interviewing these pieces, people all through Jamaica, three years of the interviewing. And it was there that I really found myself. And one of the ways of finding myself was that um, some old people, they were all old people, older, I mean younger than I am now, but they were old people at the time to me, who were virtually accusing me of giving up emancipation. Fossa August, they called it, giving up Fossa August. They looked at me and assumed that I was part of official dumb who had decided that um, emancipation was not important enough to celebrate Fossa August. And they were virtually weeping. And I promised them that I would have emancipation Fossa August back in the program. And when I went back to my rural stay, I had young children come, and we had our emancipation celebrations there, which were teach-ins. You know, children were taken from Africa. They, they had a nice thing, because they were run about, because they were going to be kidnapped. Then they were um, sold by auction, and they were put into the fields, and emancipation came, and they were freed and they were celebrating freedom. So it was in my yard that that was happened first. Then I had the good fortune of being asked to do the, um, what do they call it again? This kind of review of the Cultural Development Commission programs. And I took the opportunity of suggesting that the Fossa August emancipation be brought back in. And I think that is where it started. But having done that, I realized that there was so much missing in our knowledge of our history that um, we had to understand that most of which we had learned was, white, was in white space and we had to prepare our black space. And a black space had to be prepared by us, the so-called intellectuals who had the skills to do research and that we should be doing this kind of research. And um, apart from which, there were people who were working, but we needed to know each other. So the Black Space Reasonings was born. I mean, it was born really with some friends from um, Oklahoma University who used to bring students over. And they bring students, a lot of people brought students to Woodside to, to do things with me and then to know, to deal with the village. They called their, their work study program. And they were all white. And we were wondering whether this should be so. I can tell you a little incident that really jerked me up. I was walking up to the post office, if you're in a rural area, you know the post office is a mile away on Stone Road. And I saw this white girl coming down the road with her towel. And I asked her where she's going, and she was going to um, one of our little rivers to bathe. And I said to myself, look at this girl come from which part of North America? Know my village so much that she can be walking, going, going, going to bathe. And I don't know how many people from Kingston or how many people in Woodside itself 
know about this river and dare to go and bathe there. It's the same thing again of our being captured, of our places being given to taken over by people. She knows it just in the same way as Livingston, who went into Africa, knew this and knew that, or as Columbus came here and said, this is, this is the West Indies, when it was not the West Indies. They know our place, they can name our place, and we can't. And all of this built in the business of we have to develop black knowledge, and we have to accept black knowledge, black space. We have to create a black space. In 1999, when the government declared emancipation, they returned. Um, we in my village decided that we were going to have our emancipation celebrations. If one of the first things we did was to have a summer school. So we prepared the children to understand what was going to happen. We prepared the children. So they had the summer school, okay. And we told them all about their, their history and of course where they're coming from. And I had already written a pamphlet on the village based on information from the, in, from the archives, national archives, and information from the, pe the head of the people who remembered. And people were so involved that I would be sitting down and somebody would come with a message and say, Miss Cookie says to, that, to tell you that she never remembered to tell you that such and such a person in born that time and such and such a person named that. So it was, the village was involved, mm -hmm. okay? So having written that book, I gave it to people. I was so pleased, I gave three, three copies to each person who, who I interviewed. And I was so pleased to hear somebody to say, I said, you can sell it, you know, say, me not selling this, this, this have to put up, this have my father name inside it, okay. And, and in some cases, there are people's pictures. People wanted their history, and we're glad to have it. So, we we'll move on now to the actual, I was very surprised by people who were really my friends, who were having this emancipation celebration, and had not even gone to the archives to see the emancipation proclamation. These are my friends, these are people I respect, I could not understand it. When we had the emancipation proclamation, so what we had, first of all, the children asked for, we told the children about um, the bamboo, um, those little places that we built up, I forget the name of them right now, that we built up to do everything in, when you're wedding, everything, bamboo and coconut palm. And the children wanted to see it. And there's a man there, Gus, who had a place. And before we could even ask him, Gus had built a bamboo hut in which we had our emancipation celebrations. And the people came out. We had practiced emancipation songs because people knew them and we collected them. But when I went to the event, the drummers had taken it over totally. It had become a village thing, it was theirs. And some people were saying, what about the emancipation songs? I leave them, this is the people's thing. Okay. So they took that over, they took that over. And after we had that vigil, the next thing was going up into the hills where the enslaved people had built their own church. Now it's not something, they built their own church. Okay, so we went up the hills and we, we had an ecumenical service or whosoever wanted to pray or say anything. It was the people saying, come down again. And after that, we would have the, what we call the reenactment. And the reenactment was built from people's reactions. I remember when we read the proclamation, a man said, then what about we? God saved the queen, then what about we? We're not supposed to save too? And so on, and all of those reactions. I put into the next reenactment. And so this thing was built up from people's reaction to the emancipation. So it is the people's thing that came, the people's reactions that came, okay. And then of course, we made it a little bit more formal in that. We found the people who's, the young people, or people whose relatives are listed as having been there in 1817 and possibly then 1838. And we gave them, we, their voices, we gave them words to say. So much so that somebody got a word to say, some word to say, and the other, another person was there who had the same name, who didn't realize that this is a play, and would jump up and say, is my name, may I have to say something, you know? Okay. So um, people were involved in that. One year, the Cultural Development Commission 
decided that they were going to make our emancipation celebration the, the model, not the model, the whatever it is, all of St. Mary would come there. You know what those people did? All of those drumming that people used to do just together with dancing that we do together, they set up a platform and they had the drummers drum on the platform. No community action, and no community action, no nothing. All right. These people want to have a concert. That is all they know. And they also have in the back of their head that they're not mixing with certain people. Our emancipation celebration was everybody mixing with everybody. Everybody dancing, everybody hugging up, everybody listening. When it comes 12 o'clock and everybody jumping up and say we're free, everybody jumping up. Patterson says in his book, Slavery and Social Death, which I think is one of the most important pieces of work ever done. Everything has a history, including sticks and stones. Slaves differed from other human beings in that they were not allowed to integrate the experiences of their ancestors into their lives to inform their understanding of social reality with the inherited meanings of their natural forebears or to anchor their living present in any community of memory. That's what the slave was. They call them genealogical isolates because they did not have, they were not allowed to have grandparents who were relating to them and from whom they could learn. And they were not allowed to have children whom they could teach anything. So there are genealogical isolates. There's not a community. And until you have developed this relationship with your ancestors and with your own children, you are slaves. You will always be having to deal with other people's knowledge. Because the knowledge that is to come from your ancestors does not come. And the knowledge that you are to pass on does not pass on. And don't let me cry, because I feel that's so absolutely important that to now go and destroy Emancipation Day, which was so important to the people who were emancipated and so important to the children of the people who were emancipated. I wasn't talking to people who were emancipated in 1838. I was talking to their children, and their children carried it from, from, from the enslaved people right down and could pass it to me. And it was my job, they gave me the job of seeing to it that it be handed down. And now comes somebody want to box that out of people and not starting history when? When is the history supposed to be started? And it's not me nor Orlando Patterson that talk about the importance of history. Marcus Garvey talked about that long time. So what is their problem? What is their problem? I don't know what their problem is, except that they don't want to be related to slavery. They don't want to be related to black. What are they related to? They remain genealogically isolated. There will be no community until we can look at our history and accept it, good or bad, and work from it to do change. What have we done with emancipation? Nothing at all. And even with independence, which they are celebrating, what have they done with it? A whole pile of dancing reminds me of being on this campus as a student and not being able to understand how the greatest thing anybody could tell you was where they were fine going to have the next fit. They would find a place on the, on, the, on the science block. Oh Lord, we just find a place in the science block for a fit. We find a place on the, on the, on the aisle for a fit. We find a place here and there for a fit. Uh, is that all we can do, fit and have beauty queen? When people were, were, got their emancipation in 1838, as far as I know, no council of ex-slaves was called to say, how do we move on? Until that kind of thing is done, we are still enslaved. Until the people have decided how we should move on into freedom. So you still, the, the, this foolishness they have, pardon me, that they call in this independence, which ain't no independence at all when you have to get your resources from everywhere and you have not got your people to understand that is our thing and we have to make it. You can't be independent unless the people are freed and the people have not been freed. Uh, uh, um, this this um, British gentleman here whose name I'm not remembering right now, 
But after 1938 and the riots, they sent him down to the sociologist, sent him down to look and to report back to the committee there. And one of the things he said that in 1838, a people were freed, but a society was not formed. He's saying that in 1938, 100 years after 1838, and I'm still saying that the society has not been formed. It, uh, emancipation just went and was not used. And it is time for us to use the emancipation, not for us to cross it out. It's time for us to use it to understand it and to move from it into freedom. Wow. We always learn so much at the feet of Nana Erna Broadburn. And I'm trying to settle myself and reflect on what she has just shared with us. And actually, I feel her pain as she asks, what have we done with emancipation? And why do some people have problems with emancipation? And why they want to tamper with Emancipation Day? This is somebody who has worked all her life, spent her life in the service of her ancestors and in the cause of her ancestors. But yet so few people are listening to her. You would think that she'd be one of those griots one of the, the sources for government policy that should be consulted when there's any plan to do something about history and emancipation and, and, and culture and so on. But I want, on behalf of all those who have been listening and viewing, to thank our panelists, including Nana Erna Brunner. Thank you so much for your interventions, your excellent papers. It's now time for questions from the viewers. If you have a question, please put it in the chat. And I'm warning the presenters that I'm also going to ask each presenter to ask a question of the other presenters. That's gonna come up. So I'm looking at a question here from Dr. Shani Ropa Edwards. I'm going to ask it. And I'm going to give each of you panelists a chance to have, to give your perspective on the answer. So it is, what is the reason for the disconnect between the state's conceptualization of Emancipation Day as a celebration versus the, con the, the centrality of emancipation for healing and reconciliation? Let me read it again, it's a long question. What is the reason for the disconnect between the state's conceptualization of Emancipation Day as a celebration versus the centrality of emancipation for healing and reconciliation, which I imagine she's thinking is its potential. So I'm going to go in the same order in which people presented. Mr. Janke, your, your perspective or your attempt at an answer for that question. That, that is from YouTube. Please yeah. keep your questions coming yeah. by YouTube. Okay, thanks, thanks, Green. Um, well, it's, it's a little difficult to answer, but having been involved in the preparations for the, the recommencement of, of Emancipation Day, as part of our um, national calendar in 1997, um, I, I know that the the intent, certainly my interpretation of the intent, was that it was to be a period, not only of celebration but of reflection, on you know the path that the the, the majority of the population traveled. And, and so when, when it was, when the, the first, um, the set of commemorations were, were con conceived, certainly by, by the, the government, 
and the, and the Institute of Jamaica, where where I was and I'm still at. Um, so that that was the kind of focus. They, there were a number of events planned. Um, so it wasn't all jollification and, and celebration, singing and dancing. Yes, we recognize the, the fact that um, celebrations like Brookings were an important part of the emancipation experience. But the opportunity was also taken in that year to have a, a number of um, public forum and not, not in the, 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 the hallowed halls of the, of the mm -hmm. lecture hall of the Institute of Jamaica, not at the University of the West Indies, but out in the, in, in the, in the public eye. So for example, we, we had public sessions in St. William Grand Park, where you know, the whole issue of emancipation and what emancipation meant were, were um, put on the, on the, on the agenda. Um, it was perhaps too much to have expected at that, at that point, because the, the, the reactions of some of the, of the people who came to some of those for, um, weren't quite what we expected, um, you know, and I don't think that there was a full appreciation and, you know, coming from what Louis was saying earlier in terms of the, well, what was practically the suppression of emancipation. The, so much had been forgotten that perhaps it was a little too ambitious to expect that for the first emancipation, they, they, there would be this explosion of, you know, of a reflection on what emancipation really meant. And um, to, to, to some extent, that, 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 that whole process was never was followed through for various reasons, some of which I do. Mm -hmm. um, and so emancipation, they, unfortunately, has, has become another holiday. I, I, I was in Scots Hall yesterday for, for their annual um, celebrations, which they had continued to do on the 1st of August every year, ever since I've known of Scott's Hub, and that goes back many, many years. And on the way to, and on the way from Scott's Hub, because we had to hurry to get back to meet the curfew, um, there are a number of gatherings along the roadside in the junction where people are just having a party, you know? So who, 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 is, who is responsible for that? I, I know an attempt was made to, to really make this a reflective moment in our calendar. And um, unfortunately, I don't know that it, that it is, is really being observed in that kind of Okay. Ernest okay. Black Space um, was really a valiant you know, move and we participated in that for many years. I don't know what's happening now. Yes. But then she's still carrying on her work. Uh, yeah, I saw her yesterday, actually. It's got so yes. Long. Let me ask Lisa to have a shorter answer to that. <laughs> Sorry if I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted, Lisa. Can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, I yes. This is a short answer. I'm quite short. Um, anyhow, very quickly, I was... Um, thinking about the question, and it goes similar to what I spoke about in the literature, I, I find mm -hmm. um, the celebration is, is not threatening. When we think of celebration, we think of dancing and songs. And yes, these dancing or songs are connected to our cultural heritage. However, it doesn't really force us to think about when we talk about reconciliation and healing, these are processes and it requires accountability. It requires um, also we have to now begin to think of throwing away the old ways. So it challenges us more to, to, to think, to reflect than to celebrate. Because when you're celebrating, you're really in a festive mood. Nobody really cares about what's happening. But when you're um, thinking or reflecting on the, or healing, you have to really think about what is happening. So I think it's just um, one is more threatening than the other. The other just a way for us to not even to begin to engage. 
And that is a, a um, something that I see that comes through literature, that thread that doesn't, it doesn't, it's not very abstract, but it's something that is really getting you to think about what is emancipation. It's not just about celebration, but it's about engaging in accountability. Mm -hmm. Okay, Louis, your quick reflection on that question from Shani. Yes, yes, a very important um, question, see? Because I started out by saying that one of the issues that we have to deal with is this whole question of white fear in this country. That white fear and status quo became one. And then when we look at the laws that were passed in the 1760s and come right across the Ganja Law 1930, 1913, come right up to the 1960s. What we see is an accumulation of colonial laws intended to control black people, social control. So after 1962, two things happened. They removed from the calendar emancipation and then the colonial education, philosophy of education, remain intact and understand that education is supposed to be an emancipative process right. for newly independent people. And what we see is that the same colonial laws, the same colonial philosophy of education that in my time growing up in the 60s, all my people could tell me, don't go go fishing, don't go go shoot no bird, don't go no bush, because today is when the slaves them come out for enjoy them all a day. And it was significant, even though that the lesson supposed to be greater, but that is what they knew. Mm -hmm. But, and we look at the Jamaican people up to 1962, what have they taught us about ourselves? And yeah. that is the issue. The issue mm -hmm. is that there's a fear when you talk about black majority in this country, 1972 or 73, I came to Kingston to work with a place named Barclays Bank, DCO, and we can go into that history, Professor Shepard. And when I was driving, I used to live on off Winward Road. And when I take the bus, I come up and say a sign mark. Black majority in Jamaica now. And I never understand what it means. But in later times, I understand. It is time we get used to deal with the whole question of race as a central feature of the politics of this country. And we must use emancipation day as a point of activation in which we can assess the politics where we are and try to redefine our situation. Okay, thank you. I want to ask Mr. Janke a question. Now, Nana Erna brought, but I think kind of it, it touched on this. She kind of referenced it. She, 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 she problematized it. This is the dancing as performance and the way whoever came into her village to have that emancipation day that year tried to change up the village culture. So I want to ask, why is it that um, the, the, the dance, the culture is so much done as performance rather than an integral part of our being? In other words, I can understand that how some people justify what they do at emancipation, jubilee and so on, is that our ancestors danced and they worship and they did this or that on the, on the eve of emancipation and on emancipation day. My understanding of that, my interpretation of that is that, remember that for centuries they have suppressed African culture and African spirituality. So it's no surprise that at the moment of emancipation, they would try to, liberate their culture from the colonial oppression. But so why do we have to continue it as, as spectacle and performance rather than as an integral part of, of our culture, Mr. Janke? I wish you were asking. Well, so you want to answer that one? <laughs> I, I'll give you a try, sir. But I'm yes, man. To, it to is a large the extent. festivalization of our culture is in danger. Yes, this is what festivalization. Yeah, well, because he, festival well, because he had done the presentation, all these dances and whatever, you know, I said, let me give that to him, but I will give it to you as well. Um, Mr. Janke, from where you sit. Um, yes, well, 
the celebration was always a part of the, the emancipation uh, day experience. I mean, as I explained, but it was um, traditionally and, and to, still to some extent, for example, in Sturge Town in St. Anne's, the second free village to be established after, uh, after emancipation. They continued, even though Emancipation Day was no, no longer on the calendar, they continued to have their um, commemoration of the day. And it took the form as it did from the historical records of what people did at that time. A combination of reflection and celebration. So the, the reflection was through um, the, the church service that took place um, on the eve of emancipation, coming into emancipation day, and then they would have some kind of celebration. So that's where the music and dance would come in. But it was all related to the fact that, you know, we are celebrating our emancipation. Well, that's listen, yes, but, but all right, let me hear Louis on this first. <laughs> no, 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 I'm saying, you know, uh, I from St. Thomas. And the moment they brought in festival and start to bring the, the, the Kumina group into festival, the whole culture get destroyed. What they failed to do was to build kind of cultural centers, if I may say this, in, like in Trinidad, we have cultural centers, where people throughout the year can practice. When you start to keep this thing into competition and stuff like that, after a while, people compete and look for prizes. And then that natural process dies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think yeah. that this is the main, we need to go and revisit this thing on your festival in Jamaica because what I think it has done, it has arrested the development of the indigenous culture in this country. And one thing I forget to say in my presentation is that when you have a system that does not recognize the language spoken by the majority of the people, then we have a defective system. We have an effective educational system and we can move forward because we are teaching pick name in our English, like say, do we assume that they speak that language? And there's a lot of things we have to come and we have to deal with in emancipation. It's a period in which we are talking about reassessment. So we want to look on it. The people by themselves, Professor Shepard, used to kill them pig and have all of them celebration. And when government come now, say them are go organize it. Many of these things die. Yeah. The, Lisa, there's a question here. What is the economic significance and cultural meaning between reparation and emancipation? In other words, does emancipation matter without reparation? Um, I, I really like that question because I think in the discussion around reparation, it is very much economic. Um, in terms of a collective, because what I, I read the article um, and you mentioned it, um, Professor Shepard, in terms of land ownership and land ownership is still not, has not been fulfilled in the way in which the distribution of land um, in Jamaica, because we still find that the bulk of the African minority does not own those land, but they're working on those land. There are still workers on those land. So in economic is very much vital within that discussion and also in terms of the wages. I mentioned it in the literary paper that I, I just um, wrote, um, read in White's Regards to the Sea, where Christa, Christophine notes that, you know, while there's the paper um, where the act itself, Emancipation Act, there's still what we would refer to as slave wages. So while there's not a formal structure, um, slave structure, we still have the minimum wage. And not just in Jamaica, this is across the Caribbean where African or black um, Caribbean population are still at the bottom of the social ladder. And when we look at class, so I, I really like the fact that that question was asked first to talk about the economic and reparation and, and, and discussing how, you know, also implicating class um, capitalism and how that impacts, right? Impact the ways in which our lives are, are exploited, yeah. right? Africans yeah. are exploited through their labor and the lack of land ownership because who are the persons who own all the land when we really think about it in, in Jamaica? And we're oftentimes we're afraid to even point to the people that who own this land. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Erna Bodba kind of um, talked about the way in which we have, we still, even uh, you know, so many years after 
independence and emancipation, we haven't set out what we think our ancestors wanted from emancipation so that we could use it as a blueprint to organize the society. And I still am not going by ex exactly what they did and say that we must do that unproblematically because the, 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 the church service and so on, the missionaries made sure that that was a part of their lives in the, in the, in not in the African spirituality, that, that tradition, but in the other tradition so that they, because the post-slavery period was characterized by a process and a project of control. Control land, control labor, control their thoughts and ideas, control what they learned in school and so on. And so it seems to me that running right throughout your presentations, you all lament the absence of history education. Uh, some of you were explicit, some implicit, and Nana Bodba actually outrightly said, and it seemed like where, the, so that the education is leaving that anti-colonial, the, 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 the process of instilling anti-colonial thought is now left to the linguists and the literary scholars, if I follow you, Lisa, you know? And so what, what is stopping our, our leaders from introducing history education into all aspects of the education system? I want to hear, um, Louis, you want to take this one? What do you, because you were very strong about this as well. Lisa talked about the way literature is yes. being used for anti-colonial study and, and to instill that anti-colonial ideology. Why yes. history and why is it still out there languishing? Okay, um, you know that after uh, 1834, by about 1835, there was this Negro Education Act. And yeah. really kind of give the church a right to educate black mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Philip did in his wrote in his book, Jamaica, 1830s, present and past and present, is that he said one thing: that in our mission, when we baptize the black person, that black person cannot practice any aspect of their African tradition. One. Well, so that is their continued role in the deculturalization uh, of the black people. And at, at a higher level, when their education, the educational policy was like this, that this education that we have for the ex-slave is not anything from maths or trigger or physics or chemistry. It is about discipline. It is about habit. It is about social control. And what we see is that the philosophy underlining that kind of system is what you call a rote learning system. And that, that system informs the philosophy of education today. So when I make my point that emancipation is more than a deed, it is also a movement itself. A movement in terms of looking for freedom of people. And it cannot operate by itself. The system of education is supposed to be an emancipatory project, which it is not because Look here, Professor, when you start to talk about these things with people in education, I don't want to hear these things from you because they're not used to these kind of situations. And I'm afraid they will lose them work because they don't know about philosophy and history and all of this kind of thing. But we are saying that when we look at emancipation itself as a project, we need to include it, not just to the date, but for a process in terms of yeah. how we work to what people can understand or answer the question, who am I? Mm -hmm. You know, what is happening to, what I've noticed in the country too, as I continue to engage myself, like you, Louis, in a kind of anti-colonial project, trying to, I use history education, you use other, use politics, political ideology and, and history too. But what I notice is that some of us in this society are being put on the back foot, in other words, we are, because we are count, we, our, our understanding of history or understanding of development or understanding of the role of education in development means that we 
we have we march to a different drum, let us say, we, you know, a different drum beat. And therefore, we're constantly having to correct the myths that we hear every day, you know, spouted in places that I guess shouldn't spout these, these myths and, and ideas. So we're always seen as these anti-people, you know, when that's not what we are. We are people who are trying to say, this is, this is what we should do if we're going to create a more equitable and knowledgeable society along an anti-colonial rather than a pro-colonial path. But we are put in this situation every single time. When you read columns in the newspaper, when you listen to statements, um, government emancipation statements or messages or whatever, and then you go and say, but hey, it's not like that. You know, you are made to feel as if, oh, well, you're not supportive. Uh, and um, and how, how we will stop um, that from happening. But that's a statement of a question. But here's a question, two questions left. And then I will go to you for your own questions to each, one question to each person. Um, it sounds to me as if, all right, well, Shani actually said it all right when she was discussing the rationale for this. She was bothered by the poll, the recent poll, and the recent, almost like an announcement that there's a plan to remove the way we understand Emancipation Day and the way we celebrate Emancipation Day and Independence Day as two discrete holidays. And Erna, Nana Broadway was almost in tears when she, when, she, when she referred to that, you know, what is wrong with, with Emancipation Day that they want to remove it? So this is my question. What is wrong with Emancipation Day and why do people want to change the way uh, it is on the calendar? So that's to each of you. And the, I think I will leave that as my last question and then ask each of you to ask a question of each other or just make a closing statement. Um, I could answer that question, um, Professor. Go ahead. Yeah, I, could, I, I, I find the both Emancipation Day and Independent Days, particularly Emancipation Day, very problematic. I'm not against it because it, it needs to be here. However, I find that it makes almost no sense. It's meaningless having Emancipation Day if in our everyday lives, I think um, Professor Moisten had alluded to that, it's a project. So here we have a day today, we're talking about emancipation, we're having these celebratory activities. But then when we go into the school system, there's this contradictory ways in which the students are now being conflicted in how they embrace their identity. We're still having discussion around natural hair and the different types of natural hairstyles. Um, Professor Moisten also talked about the language. There's still no language rights around the use of fatwa in the schools. So there's a contradiction that is constantly being met with the students who, you know, here we're supposed to be, if, we're, if it's a project, these are rudiments of colonialism and legacy that should not be in the classroom. So until we get rid of these colonial ideas of the, in the classroom, I, I just don't see Emancipation Day as something that is effective because yes, we're gonna to come today, activities, and then we're gonna go into the classroom and then students are now gonna to be told, you can't be yourself. Um, just in 2019, when the Obia laws were going to be repealed, we got that swift backlash. So that contradiction is constantly in conflict with the day itself. So until we can clear up these contradictions, which is going to be a long time, that project that um, um, Professor mentioned, I, I, I just think Emancipation Day to me seems very superficial. That's Louis, just, your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, you know, um, there's a young lecturer at Barbados, uh, Mona Campos, Marja Damini. And he said one thing, he said, you know, we deal with six on students. And when they come to class, when you look at the scale for critical thinking, for comprehension, analysis, evaluation, and synthesis, and so forth, they pass only the first stage with this comprehension. That there is an authoritarian quality of colonial education that almost put the students in a position in which they cannot enter into contention with the system. And when you look at education itself, it is about conformity with the system. 
It is not about people free. And I'm saying that when you look that emancipation, there should be a point of assessment. It should be a point of emancipation and that it is not just a date like birthday and Christmas and all of those kind of things. Good. That we see all the days that don't really come from out of experience take precedence of our life. And I grew up as like a Christian youth, but I'm sorry, I'm not a Christian today. And I believe that Christianity that has played a role in our conquest is too much in the role in our emancipatory project and as such has arrested our development. And we need to talk about the role of the Christians in this country. Because when we look into the, at the pandemic and the post-pandemic experience, that anybody that studied history of pandemic will really argue that the church itself has to go through some form of transformation. 15th century, transformation. Will the church continue to be what it is? Or will it begin to play a role in the mental emancipation of black people? And those are some of the issues that we have. New philosophy of education, very simple. Government accept that the majority of the people speak a language and the next September, whenever we have national holidays, we say, look here, Patois is an official language. And we are going to teach the Pitney the School to learn English, the language of education, the language of business. And we're not going to teach them under the assumption that they know what English is. And that is, to me, a crime of humanity to have a whole nation of people here teach them under the notion that they speak English when they don't. Uh, Mr. Janky, and then I'm going to give each of you a minute to say your wrap up. Mr. Janky? Okay, thanks, Vereen. Um, Can I say something? Uh, do you still want to say something or you said you're something already? Is this a new request in the chat? Lisa, you have a request in the chat. No, 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 that's okay. That was before and you- Oh, oh okay, that's fine. Mr. Janky, um, I don't know. If you don't feel comfortable um, speaking to that, Mr. Janky, it's okay. No, I no, not, not at all, not at all. you were. Yeah, so what is wrong? Why would <laughs> no, want no, to I make understand and I, and, I, and I appreciate your, your, <laughs> your sensitivity. <laughs> um, but I just want to reiterate something I said earlier in terms of, um, and this came out of the whole review of national symbols and in the, in the, in the 90s and, and the resulting Pereira report. The whole concept of reinstalling Emancipation Day as a commemorative event was not um, based on just, just the, the whole past, you know, project of jollification and celebration, although that would be a part of it. It was also conceived to be a, 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 a point of reflection. And that's how the, the, that first um, Emancipation Day um, project of the 90s started out, but it has been a difficult thing to maintain. And I think we underestimated just how difficult it would be because there's also the, 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 the issue of um, this collective amnesia and almost schizophrenia that, that has surrounded us as a, as a people coming out of this whole mm -hmm. horrific experience of enslavement. But, so, you know, it, it is Mr. something Jackie, that is going I, to take a long time. Yeah, but I think that, I don't know if, if removing Emancipation Day and making it a Friday and, and the, um, the, the, the Independence Day Monday and just having a long weekend, I don't know if that is not going to solve the problem that we're no. seeing with emancipation. And to say that there's a poll and the people um, said they agree that they should just collapse everything into a weekend. I, I also am not sure that that is a good justification because based on the question that I'm told was asked, if anybody asked me that, I would say, yes, do I want long holiday? If you ask me, wouldn't you rather have a long weekend where emancipation and independence are together? I might just say yes too. I mean, not me personally with my knowledge, but you know, a person who does have my consciousness and so on might say, yeah, you know? So, so but I, I think we should use 
Emancipation Day and Independence Day to teach and to have different kinds of, of celebration. If we continue, we are going, the generation people won't even know what, what that was and everybody will have to go start over and tell them, you know? Um, so this is, this, is the, yeah. this, is, this is my issue. And then Lisa spoke in her presentation. Let me see if I get it right. You talked about respect, the respectability politics. And I am wondering if you see that also in even how emancipation and independence are performed. Because I see it, I, I, what, I don't know if I'm interpreting your respectability politics in the way you meant it, but I'm seeing that because I always, someone who used schizophrenia, it's, <laughs> I always say to myself, there we are celebrating or emancipation or, or independence, and there the governor general drives up. There we are parades, and then we have brokings, and then they tell us it's because it's out of many one people. You know, this is something I find totally problematic. You know, um, I find it also curious that Jamaica does not have a national emancipation day or a national independence day lecture like some other countries. And I do not think the church's emancipation lecture should become our national emancipation lecture um, because, again, it's part of the problem. Even if the speaker might have a good lecture the whole thing that surrounds it, the performance of that, the respectability and the religious dialogue, I think it's, it's not serving the purpose that I would like to see um, emancipation serve. So your Can closing turn into thoughts. Religion? Yes, yeah, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to give your closing thoughts. I'm going to go in reverse order. So Louis, then Lisa, then um, Bernard. Yeah, well, for me, it's really a simple thing, you know. The whole issue of race in politics is thing that some people prefer not to talk about. And it is what I'm saying must take place right now. When people do not want to hear about emancipation, it is really because they want to maintain status quo and what is status quo. And we are saying that while dates are important, whether it's your birthday, whether it's a Christian holiday, good, or whether it is other British day that you celebrate here, like Labor Day, it is very important to see Emancipation Day, not as a date, but also as a project around which we are going to look for reassessment and see where we are. And we see it as a day that is sacred and that it should not be touched and that the politicians in 1962 who fear it are the same politicians in 1938 who never want to celebrate it. And it's the same politician in the 2020s who want to desecrate and tarnish that holiday. And I'm saying that we must be very clear. We need to redefine and we need to have certain activities Emancipation Day coming on, and it is this. the festivalization of Jamaican culture has done much to destroy the culture. One look. Okay, I, I was on a radio show with another panelist, and um, who was on the committee, as it turns out, to debate what we should do with Emancipation Day, and that was that was when I was getting a kind of understanding of the the. The, the commercial dimension of the justification. And some years ago, when the issue came up, it was the same issue that business people were saying that they have to open up the place, then close it back. And then before you know it, it's Independence Day. But I say, so what? Our ancestors, when they were fighting for, in the, for, in the, for true emancipation, which I still call independence, they didn't care if it was Saturday, Sunday, if it happened today and then tomorrow. And so while we're not insensitive to the means of the means and markets of production, two days out of the, you know, or a couple of days out of, or a few days out of the year to do honor to our ancestors. I, I don't see why a minority should, should change that. And when I say a minority, I'm not talking about the polls. Again, 
is what you ask people. So, um, whose turn is it now? Lisa, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Prof. Um, just very quickly, I just wanted to um, note just something that um, Dr. Weston had mentioned, um, which got my brain thinking. Um, he mentioned the churches and immediately I thought about in terms of the church role, the church's role in emancipation. And I thought about uh, liberation theology, which is something that was, has been traditional within emancipation. And because Sam Sharp, that is what he used. This is how he conscientized the, the populace under condition. However, my question um, is just very quickly, you know, how with a country that is so seeped into Christianity, we've moved away from that. And this is not to knock religion, but we've moved away from that liberation theology. How is it so, how are we going to get back to that state within our, in, the, in, in terms of the religious dialogue? And just last um, but not least, um, in terms of emancipation as well, we can't just lock it in the past. We also have to get young people, uh, uh, get an understanding of how, and, and that's how I think we, we treat history as the past, something that happened before. So we don't really have to, when we do talk about it or think about it, it's in a very celebratory way. But again, I'm gonna stress, if we're gonna take it out of history, just like the, the writers have done, they have not locked it into history, they brought it to the present and they've related it to the social concrete conditions of the people. So in order for us to be conscientized uh, around our social concrete conditions, we're gonna to have to move beyond just locking Emancipation Day or Emancipation, the, the project itself into the past. And by doing so, we're gonna to have to address fundamental issues. And I spoke about one earlier that um, Professor um, Shepherd had mentioned in her art, in the article, um, the Gleaner article um, yesterday, and that is about land reformation. So we have to talk about it within an economic um, context and the ways in which people's lives are materially and concretely being affected mm -hmm. by this idea of not being free because until then we're going to be unfree. And then of course there's other so concrete um, social conditions that that came out from everyone on the panel. These are the issues that we have to look at to move forward. So taking emancipation out of the past and contextualizing it into the present. I have to say though that when I hear other scholars um, say this, literary scholars, political scientists and so on, I'm saying that I think you're not, the, you're not watching what historians are doing really um, because no historian that I know now is, is lodged in the past. They use history to explain the present and to get people to try and understand how it can shape the future. So you have to, you have to teach the past in order to, to get people to understand how the present is connected to the past. So we cannot just dismiss the past. And I, I don't know any historian who is just buried there and it's not moving, you know? Um, and it's, it's not just literary scholars that are doing this. Uh, but in fact, when I read historical novels, they very much use history as a launching pad. Um, so, and, so I don't think it's Emancipation Day that is a problem um, and where you put it. It is what you do with it and who is controlling the narrative and who is not teaching history in the school so that the, the children will appreciate what is Emancipation Day and what they can do with it. If they don't get any direction, then they say, well, I'm going to the beach and so on. And nothing is wrong with going to the beach on a public holiday. But I think there has to be direction in how you start the day and then what you, you go on to do after that. Mr. Janke? Oh, sorry, um, um, Professor. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to make myself clear. I'm not saying that the historians, the historians are the ones who are doing it. I'm talking about the way it's being taught in school and just how it's being taught in terms of a national level. I would, I would not for once suggest that the historians, given the, the importance and the significance of the uh, in, in storage in terms of our archival um, history. Um, I'm, yeah. just, I'm speaking to the ways in which it's being taught in okay. the on a national okay. level. Just yes, to but even the issue of Sam Sharp and religion, you know, a lot of them, and if, if you look at the, the, the testimonies of those who were punished in this war, and when they tell you about what Sam Sharp was doing, I think you'll have a different idea of how we used the, the, the local Baptist church. Um, a, a lot of people don't even realize that Sam Sharp was armed and that he saw people to fight um, until 
the system was ended. I gave an emancipation lecture today because I insist that if nobody else is giving one, I'm going to give one. And it was on Nationwide 9 FM today. And, I, and that was, I tried to use, I used all the documents uh, from the archives and reshaped the knowledge of emancipation and what Sharp was doing and his, and his lieutenants and the gangs that, that they formed right across the island. You know, uh, we have to look back. The, the, the Baptists need to take Sam Sharp, com not completely, because he was a part of the, the Native Baptist um, Church. But what, as you say, liberation theology, what he did with that, but also that he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't foolish enough to think I could just sit down and that don't work tomorrow when you start a war. He was planning it all along, all uh, along. Professor Shepard. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say something because before there was liberation theology, there was a thing named radical black spirituality. Yeah, true. We see it from Macandal in 80. We see it from Taki yes. in 1760. Yes. And yes. we see it all along coming that it wasn't Karl Marx or Lenin or anybody who gave black people an idea for liberation. Ideology. It true. was true. It was true that radical black spirituality and it's one of the things that we need to deal with and understand in a significant kind of way and by yes. the way if we do that in a reasonable way we can understand why we have the kind of music that we have good just like you refer to a book named working in spirits by a man named murphy i look at it and tell you because there are certain things that we're not talk about we're not talk about working in the spirits we get into the abstraction of Western philosophy and leave our experience. And I'm saying that we need to recognize our indigenous language and we need to find a way in which we can create our indigenous knowledge. No that argument with that, no argument. Uh, you have the penultimate word, Mr. Janky, then I will close. Thanks, Tureen. I mean, I... <laughs> There is so much that has been said that I that I agree with. I really don't want to be be repetitious, but just um, in terms of, I mean, I don't see Emancipation Day as a holiday. I don't. For me, it's a point of reflection. It's a point of celebration, but it's a point of reflection. And in my in my opening, I referred to um, Sankofa. It is it is Sankofa. It, it in practice, really, for, for, for me. And I, I think it is important for us to use it as part of the process of re-educating our people right. in terms of Thank you so much. the value Thank you. of our history. Thank you so much. All that is left for me now is to thank each panelist for your presentations, your interventions, your discussion, your handling of the questions, and thanks to the audience for joining us. Thanks also to the technical people who made this possible, to the museum staff, to Shani herself, and to the staff of the Center for Reparation Research. But as we go, I want to invite all of us to really reflect on the meaning of Emancipation Day and what it took our ancestors to give us this freedom. Because I, I don't see it, I, I don't really use the Emancipation Proclamation as anything. It's just an historical document for me. Because the true documentation is in the testimonies of those who were executed. And before they were executed, what they left for us to understand. I want to remind us all that in 1832, the trials took place before the executions. In Hanover, 58 people were tried by a court martial, 82 by civil, civil court, the uncivil court, by the way. In Manchester, court martial 15, civil court 16. Portland, court martial 23, slave court 5. St. Elizabeth, all were tried by court martial after short court martial. 73 of them by court martial. In St. James, the center of the war, 100 were tried by court martial, 81 by civil slave court. St. Thomas in the East, 11 tried by court martial, five by civil court. St. Thomas in the Vale, which is now part of St. Catherine, nine 
tried by court martial. Trelawney, all by court martial, 70 of them. Westmoreland, court martial, 26, slave court, 52. That's, that's 626 people um, who were tried. And the punishments will make your, you, you know, you really will have to say who could do these things to people. How do you give Andrew from Wickham in Manchester 200 lashes? Who administered the lashes? How long did it take? And did he survive? William Wilson from Wickham, sentenced to death at 36 years old. Spur, from Spur Tree Robert Brown, 42 years old, sentenced to death. Jacob from Marlborough Mount, deported, 40 years old. That they don't say to where. And the sentences of death, execution, flogging, transportation, imprisonment, just continued, continued, continued. We need to visit the, the monument with these names behind the Civic Center in Montego Bay every year and have an event there. And each of these 10 parishes from which the revolutionaries came should actually put their names on a monument in their city center. This is one of those Emancipation Day projects that, that we need to, to engage in because we don't do that, you know? We're not honoring our, our ancestors sufficiently. So thank you everyone, thank you and have a great rest of the day. Thank Thanks. you. Tolerating Thank me as your moderator. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. <laughs> always. Bye bye oh, now, bye. everyone. Bye bye. bye. A pleasure. Merchant ships Minutes after they took I From the bottomless pit But my hand was made strong By the end of the Almighty We forward in this generation Triumphantly won't you help to sing These songs of freedom Cause all I ever have Redemption songs Redemption songs Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery None but ourselves can free our mind have no fear for atomic energy Cause none of them can stop the time How long shall they kill our prophets While we stand aside and look Ooh, Some say it's just a part of it We've got to fulfill the book Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom Cause all I ever had Redemption songs Redemption songs Redemption